It's July 3rd, 2016, and it's 9.30 in the morning on a beautiful summer day. A young boy lives in the South Park neighborhood of Houston, Texas. He sees a man sleeping. For some unknown reason, it scares him. He goes and gets his father. Hey, you need some help? He says, hey, wake up. The person doesn't move. Now the dad becomes alarmed, and he calls 911. EMTs arrive. They discover it's a woman, perhaps early 30s. This is an awful scene. It's 4th of July weekend, and everyone else in Houston is getting ready for fireworks and picnics, except for the police. They have a body on their hands. I spent my career closing murder cases, but I'm not the only one who answered the call. It takes a rare breed to solve the unsolvable, to catch a ruthless killer, to find justice for the dead. That's what it takes to be an American detective. My name is Brian Harris. I'm a retired detective sergeant from the Houston Police Department Homicide Division. I worked in the Homicide Division for almost 22 years. It was a Sunday morning. I'm sipping my first sips of coffee. And sure enough, cell phone went off, and I knew it. This is Harris. Patrol had informed our homicide desk that there was a dead body across from Jones High School, located in southeast Houston. enough angle that it would have caught the dumping of our victim's body. 
Is that surveillance equipment only on during school hours? Where is it pointed? Well, we want to see that video footage. And if there's nothing to it, well, then there's nothing to it. But there could be something. Turns out they quickly were able to burn a copy and we were able to see the video footage. You see two headlights. And sure enough, right at the spot of where the body, some kind of movement going around towards the passenger side of the vehicle, which would be consistent where our transfer blood is. And then you see what looks like somebody dragging something big from the passenger side. There seems to be some kind of movement towards the ditch. And then the vehicle takes off again. It's all making sense. This crime scene's talking to us. The next day, of course, is the 4th of July. Everyone's getting ready for hamburgers, hot dogs, and beer. But Harris and Perez have a job to do. They're going to go to an autopsy, not a picnic. Want to die? The autopsies and wounds tell a story just like a crime scene tells a story. It's close contact wound. So we're looking to see if it's a clean wound, and it's not. You have what's called stiff. That explosion goes into the skin, so it almost looks like burn particles all around the wound. And if the gun is a close impact wound, it will literally brand your skin, and you can't wipe it away. No signs of projectile. Any kind of ballistics evidence that was left inside the skull, like say a fire bullet, it would have been really helpful, but we didn't know what kind of weapon we were looking for. Have you guys got any idea yet? Not yet. We need to run the prints. Well, in the state of Texas, they take a fingerprint from you when you get a driver's license. If this person has a driver's license, there should be a record of her fingerprints. On July 5th, uh -huh. we get the hit on the fingerprints, and events really started to roll very quickly as far as us being able to determine victim was the victim is a 31 year old female named kumba cc now who decided that kumba needs to go away somebody certainly did one of the first steps to interview family members and that was going to be mike's job michael perez is about to make his first death notification to a family There's not many things uglier than that in that line of work, particularly when you arrive at the door wearing a suit, holding up a badge to identify yourself as the police. Being the first actual victim's family that I'm gonna have. The person that opens that door knows why you're here and knows what you're going to say because someone is not home who's supposed to be home. Mr. Cissé? You see it in their face. I saw it there every time. <laughs> they know this is the moment they've dreaded all their lives. Thank you. Miss Cissé, she was in shock. She was not really wanting to believe what happened. I asked for some background on her daughter. She told me that she was, you know, a good kid growing up. She had lots of friends. I am a friend slash sister to Kumba. It was real close. She was a sweet person. She didn't like seeing people down. Didn't have a bad bone in her body. <laughs> she had great energy, good vibes, and she was on her way to be something. She was good to me. Her parents.
parents are immigrants from Sierra Leone and Central Africa, but Kumba was born in the United States. She's going places at her young age and has done very well for herself. Kumba was a mover. She was a shaker and she was on her path to success. She was modeling and she had a model career. But she wasn't just satisfied to rest her laurels on being a model. She was working as the host of an internet radio show. And she would interview people on controversial topics and also present independent hip-hop artists to the community. She had ambition. She had dreams. Kumba Sise seemed to have it going on. She was going to use the platforms to get to where she needed to be. It's pretty obvious that Kumba is a together person. She paints a very different picture than you often see among homicide victims who live a dangerous lifestyle. Kumba does not do that. When was the last time you heard from your daughter? She was here on Saturday. Saturday? Kumba's mother. She had said that Saturday morning. At about 11, Kumba showed up. Hey, Ma! Hey, Vic! And was talking about going to a party. It was supposed to be later on that evening, and then Kumba left. Perez asked the family, was there anyone that Kumbo was having problems with? As Mike is hearing information from family members, there are a couple of possibilities as far as potential suspects. One being a former boyfriend in which they had a rocky relationship and he was very bitter. His name is David Gabriel and apparently his relationship... Leave me alone! Money can be a very powerful motive. Money drives people. All sorts of things come back to money as a very strong motive in violent crime. Is that what happened with Mr. Gabriel? I think we better find out. But before Perez leaves, Kumba's family provides a final critical piece of information. What about the car? You guys found it yet? No, we weren't aware. Can you describe it? Her brother did say that Kumba had a vehicle, the blue Volkswagen Beetle. So now we have a vehicle missing. Now Perez has something he can pursue. <laughs> Here we have a woman shot to death with a single gunshot wound, and the car has been stolen, perhaps, by the person who shot her. The only thing the video could confirm was that we were dealing with a small, perhaps bubble-shaped type vehicle, the way it was designed, dark in color, but our instinct was telling us, is this a beetle? Where is that car? Who has it now? Did he kill for it? Well, we're about to see. the 6th of July. Hey, it's Sergeant Harris. Got a bolo for you. Harris and Perez put out a bolo to be on the lookout for this car. 2004 Volkswagen Beetle, blue in color. But before the hit comes back on the car, Perez wants to talk to a bitter ex-boyfriend of Kumba, whose name is David Gabriel. Kumba did have an abusive boyfriend, but they broke up. Apparently, Kumba had owned some money. Well, now, come on down, my friend. You are the next contestant on the murder is right. I hear that you and Kumba parted on bad terms. He says, I'm sure you're aware that Kumba's been murdered. And it's my understanding that you had a dispute with her over money. It's just a misunderstanding, boy. He says Kumba had her own money, she had her own job, and she would take care of herself. Gabriel says the issue was moot. Well, anybody could say that, so we're going to need some other information, Mr. Gabriel. Where were you on the night this murder occurred? I was outside of town at a house party. Can anybody verify that? Yeah. Gabriel was in front of a couple of dozen witnesses. Perez checks out the alibi, and they all independently confirm that David Gabriel was present all evening at this party. Appreciate you. So, Gabriel is out. Homicide investigation is a series of challenges, and initially it's often more bad news than good. You cannot lose your resolve. You have to play the game. You often hear people say, well, I'll just have to wait for a break. No, you don't wait for anything. You make your own breaks. You make your own luck. Very long for somebody to say, hey, we have that car. Lo and behold, by Texas Southern University, there's a report of a vehicle fire. This car is found across the street from a Texas Southern University dormitory building. A burned out blue Volkswagen bug. Well, who's responsible for this mess? The arson investigators run the vehicle identification number. They say that it's linked to our homicide report and the death of Kumba. 
So they go to the vehicle examination building. I'm a second Perez, sorry, Perez. This is her car. This eliminates a carjacking. Why steal a car at gunpoint and then set it on fire? You know, it's not as burned up in the back as you might think. People forget this. Fire needs oxygen. And when you roll up all the windows and then you set the car on fire, it's some serious damage. But it's not going to last very long. It's a panic attempt at the destruction of evidence. You're going to try to burn a car with a gallon of gasoline with the windows rolled up? You're not exactly the brightest bulb in the fixture, and you don't have much of a plan. It's not a carjacking. It's none of those things. It's somebody she knows, someone she's connected to. That's who killed her. They examine this car, and they discover blood on the inside of the driver's door. We requested swabs of DNA be taken. All right, thank you for your time. All right. And we're hoping upon hope that at Texas Southern University, perhaps that there's video. So I drove to check the area out where the vehicles burned. And I was able to have their surveillance pulled so we can view that video. When they review that surveillance footage, Someone abandons that Volkswagen Beetle car at 2.07 a.m. on the 4th of July. And in the footage, returns a day later on the 5th of July. In the company of someone driving a Buick with Sabre. You see the outline. Clearly, it's the Volkswagen Bug. And then a figure starts rummaging around in that vehicle. The next thing you see is a big flash, a big burst. And then as they're literally running away, the vehicle is in flames. Who brought that person to that scene? Somebody's helping this killer cover their tracks. While I was doing research on the vehicle, I received a phone call from a man named Carlton Turney. He said that he's a concert promoter. He has an ID that was found. This individual had called up Perez and said he'd been following the story on the news. He was putting on a party, and he rented out a warehouse in the southeast side of town, further east of where the body was found. The party was Saturday, July 2nd, the night of the murder. He said it ended about 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. Later on that evening, he got a phone call from this guy who owns a warehouse. One of your people from your party dropped their ID. So this probably belongs to one of them. He has the ID card to Perez and Harris, and it's the ID card of Kumba Zise. I noticed there was some blood on the bottom corner of the ID card. Not only is it her ID, it is smeared with blood. For now, you have a working theory that Kumba was at this late on Saturday night. So the likelihood is great that the shooting occurs in the parking lot and somehow or other the ID card falls out of that car. The problem is the identity of the person behind this is still a mystery. Who are they and why do they want this young woman dead? Now Harris and Perez are convinced that someone whom knew killed her. So they're going to focus on who knows her well. They begin by going to the internet radio station style radio and speaking to the general manager a donald hilliard i want to talk to you about one of your hosts kumba sisei yeah kumba oh my girl kumba was well regarded by her boss at that station don hilliard and don hilliard thought this woman was going to have a national following one day you are listening to houston's leading internet radio show she had it she had it she had that radio voice she had their personality. She really was a real deal. Mr. Hillard explains that Kumba has a boyfriend that on occasion was a co-host with her. Don revealed crucial information about Kumba's current boyfriend. His name was Leroy Stutz. Now, this is the first time Harris and Perez have heard that name. We would have good shows, you know. Kumba, recently she had been allowing Leroy Stutes to partake in the radio broadcast. Do you believe in 
generational curse. They discussed music, lifestyle. She was always a go-getter. She was going to make sure she did what she needed to do to get where she wanted to be. And that made him jealous. He didn't like it. The police learned that Kumba had invited another woman to co-host one of the programs. Yeah. And when Stoops found out about this, he went wild. We told me to calm down. This is our show. He went into a rage. Leroy seemed extremely irritated that Kumba was more popular. And Leroy, he didn't generate the same popularity that Kumba did. Is that a motive for murder? Not having enough fans? Who knows what comprises a motive? People have a reason to kill. It often can be a completely insane reason, but it's a reason. And then the event that set everything off, and that was the end of Leroy's radio career. I think we as women need to take the time to empower men. You don't complain about this, you complain about that. Women, all the same, all of you. So maybe when you're up here giving advice? Leroy went on a rant using the most degrading terms. Yeah, you sit there on that mic saying this. Doc said I had to let him go. I couldn't have this kind of personality on the air and jeopardize everything that Kumba and himself had built up. So what is it that you're upset about, Leroy? Is it the fan thing or is it something else? Let's find out exactly who you are, Leroy, and see what you've been up to in your life. So President Harris pulled a record in criminal history of one Leroy Stutz. Hey, Mike, come check this out. And they are floored by what they find. In 1992, he committed a murder. And was convicted in that case and received a sentence of 45 years in prison and served almost 18 years of that sentence. A 45-year sentence for murder or for some unknown reason a parole board releases him. Well, Leroy, you seem like a charming fellow. So, Kumba, what are you doing with this thug? That's the question. There are young women, unfortunately, who are attracted to the bad boys, the wild and free type. The trouble with Bad boys is they do bad things. We don't have enough to get a warrant on this guy to even bring him in and talk to him. Right now, everything is just circumstantial. Paris and Perez would like to assemble an affidavit in support of an arrest warrant for Leroy Stoops, but they don't have it. And they know they don't. That's the worst position to be in. So what do you do? You keep looking. You keep moving forward. surveillance tips show the Buick LeSabre. Harris does a registration check on Buick LeSabres that might be associated with the Stutz family, and it turns out Leroy's daughter Latrice... How we were going to proceed with this was Latrice at the scene. Things have gotten even more interesting. Shortly after this point, my phone rings and I get a call. And there's a man on the line named Daryl. Okay. And he sounds very panicked. Daryl identifies himself as Leroy's cousin. What Daryl said was that very late on July 2nd, he was over at his sister's house, Rhonda's, which is also in southeast Houston. Next thing, Leroy shows up. Just listen to me, all right? Because we ain't got time. Leroy had scratches on his face, and Leroy needs a change of clothes, and he's panicked. Leroy Stutes has blood on his clothes, and Darrell doesn't like any part of this. All right, I... And so Daryl was able to provide Leroy with a new set of clothes, new shoes, but he left a pair of boots. Well, we'll be right over to see you. Come on, quick. I don't want nobody seeing and you got to keep in mind, there is a intelligence network in the underground who's saying what about whom and who is disloyal to others. They're not interested in helping the police. They're interested in helping the victim. There's a pair of brown boulder boots. Yeah, it looks like blood. And I noticed there's blood on boots. It's a remarkable find in terms of evidence to be examined by forensics. 
I'll get these over to the property room and have them swap for blood. In the meantime, I'm going to see what I can find out about the daughter. What can she tell us about what dear old dad has been up to? Detective Perez. Now must run forensics tests on a pair of boots that belong to our primary suspect, Leroy Stutz. Yep, that's a positive ID for blood. With that information, I call Harris back. I said, hey, look, it's blood. He says, all right, I'm going to call the DA. Harris issues arrest warrants for Leroy Stutz for first degree murder. But where is he now? Harris wants to talk to Leroy's daughter, Latrice. The kind of car that Latrice drives, the Buick, is very similar to the car that we see on the video. Well, what do you have to say about that, Latrice? Harris is an expert interrogator that Perez has to learn, so he's going to allow Perez to do this. He will oversee it, but Perez will do it. And try to get information that is crucial to the case. Let's talk about your father. When I was talking to Latrice during the interview, I asked her if she was really close to her dad. She said, no, not at all. I know what I think. But I want to know I said, he's been away for a long time. Have you tried to get close? Not really. So then I asked her, well, do you think he's capable of hurting somebody? Well, I mean, she says, well, yeah, he can hurt somebody. I said, well, do you think he may have hurt Kuba? He said, well, they have arguments. But what they do behind closed doors is what they do behind closed doors. So she left it at that. So I bring up the Volkswagen. He asked me to take him over. She says, well, my dad asked me to take him over there. She said he got out of the car and went to the door and then came back to the car and we left. I said, you didn't see him burn the car or anything like that? She's like, no, I didn't see any of that. She doesn't reveal that she sees him set it on fire, but it's pretty darn good statement. And hats off to Mike to getting somebody who is very hostile inadvertently without her even knowing reveal very damaging information about her father. I think of that old show, Kung Fu, where they have the pebble in the hand, and before you become the master, you gotta grab that pebble. Clearly, Mike was ready now to grab that pebble from my hand. Latrice is evasive and uncooperative, but she finally puts Leroy Stutes in the middle of that VW one or two moments before it begins to burn. So they actually got from her what they wanted. Therein lies the art of interrogation. Given that information and the footage, Latrice Stutz could be an accessory after the fact to that crime. And she's placed in custody. But our suspect, Leroy Stutz, is still in the wind. In the meantime, Harris and Perez need to start building their case, starting with the motive. What made him kill her? Because right now, you don't know. You're convinced you know it's him, and you're probably right about that. But why did he do it? Sir Harris discovers Latasha White. Kumba and her, they were very good friends, and Harris always wondered why Kumba would associate with a criminal like Leroy Stutes. Latasha White provides an answer to that question in the fact that Leroy Stutes lied to her. Originally, he told us the reason he went to jail was because he had did a robbery. He did not tell us that he murdered somebody. Leroy Stutz lied to Kumba, said he'd been in prison, but it was for robbery, and he took the fall for an associate and good friend. Kumba tells her friend, Leroy's not the guy that I thought he was. I, I gotta find a way out from under this dude. For real, for real. The man told him lies he couldn't keep up with him. Kumba, she knew Leroy had been to prison, but in the last few days she finds out, uh, it's not robbery or burglary, it's murder. Kumba told me, I think he came. And I was like, what you mean? And she was like, I heard something, I think he gay. There were rumors about Kumba confronting Stutes about his sexual history in prison. So you begin to unravel the onion. You pull away one layer after another. Who are you, Leroy? And what pushed your buttons to the point where your girlfriend wound up dead? We also believe that Leroy is pretty pissed. He didn't like the idea that Kumba was telling people he was sleeping with men. And so he was angry. This was a time bomb ready to explode. When criminals flee, they go to predictable places. Sometimes they go where their money is, their mama is, or sometimes their main squeeze who might 
them or help them because no one else will. And true to form. Uh, uh, so you know, I've just got a couple of pairs that I want to get. After a week of searching. Our man Leroy Stutes is seen stepping out of his mother's car at a commercial business. Leroy Stutes, you are under arrest for the murder of Kuba Cisse. And he's arrested without incident for first degree murder. What's over there?
back in the car and he drives over to Rhonda's house. He asks Daryl for a change of clothes, but he messes up. He leaves his polo boots behind. And then at some point in time, he goes to TSU and he drops off the car. Later on, he contacts his daughter. He wants to ride. And she admits that she's at the TSU campus, puts him with the vehicle. And the only thing she doesn't admit to is seeing him actually set it on fire. The car gets torched. to trial pleads not guilty a person in his mind is someone insulted him you don't do that not to him when the trial is over the jury finds him guilty unanimously and he is sentenced to life without parole in the texas state penitentiary system where he remains to this day a killer a murderer a monster that's what he is a monster i just want to say something to leroy i hope he rot in hell i hope that they don't give him the death penalty. I want him to live with what he has done for the rest of his life and die knowing what he did. This case really is like so many other domestic violence when the woman finally decides, this is it, I've had enough, I'm gonna move on. That's also the most dangerous time. And at least for Kumba, it was the deadliest time. If they parole boy would have never let that man out, Kumba would probably be on 97.9 right now. When he took her, he took a lot from a lot of people. He took away a sweet person. Like, this girl would, oh my God. Harrison Perez did not get a confession in this case. Hardly anyone ever does. That's not the point. The point is they conduct a thorough professional investigation resulting in the arrest and conviction of a person responsible for killing. What a piece of work. The sociopath in action and results in the tragic loss of a 31-year-old girl who just wanted to live her life and found precisely the wrong person to play with.